Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you guys all for joining us. Uh, this is Lisa with ITSM Academy. We're very glad to have you guys here today, um, the roundtable speakers and, the, um, and our attendees. We have four DevOps ambassadors who are all gonna bring us a different and deep perspective on SRA. We got some great questions from you guys as you were registering. So any of those questions that we don't answer during the presentation, we're gonna take at the end and we're reserving 20 minutes at the end just for Q&A. So first up is Helen Beal and Helen is serving today as both our first speaker and our moderator. So Helen, I'm passing it to you. Lovely, thanks Lisa and hello everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and to be joined by my fellow ambassadors, Donna Ladry and Craig. We're gonna split the hour into three today. So part one, we're all, all gonna give you, each of us four ambassadors gonna give you five minutes on different perspectives around SRE. Then we're gonna spend about 20 minutes having a panel discussion between the four of us. As Lisa just said, I'll be moderating that. And then the last 20 minutes, we're gonna be answering those questions that you've already submitted and any others that you'd like to pass to us today as you hear us speak. So um, we're gonna start actually with a poll. Uh, we've got three polls today. This first one, we wanna know how familiar you are with SRE. So the poll should be up on your screen now and you have a number of options. It's either it's new to you entirely or perhaps you are already a site reliability engineer. Um, perhaps you've taken the DevOps Institute SRE Foundation qualification already, or perhaps your organization is already very, very capable in terms of its SRE uh, um, adoption. So please pop your answers in there, and Donna is, is managing the poll today, so she'll make a call in a moment, I'm sure, uh, if we have enough answers to have a look and see how we're going. How's it looking, Donna? She's on mute, so she might be talking. I am, and thank you very much for <laughs> that. So 72%, it's new to me. Thus far, we don't have any SREs in the house. 4% are SRE foundation certified. 4% are reaping the benefits, which is awesome. And we have 22%, oh, it's up to 25% now with others. So please chat your answer in uh, for others so we can kind of get a read on what that, what that other is all about. And we'll kind of continue to report out on that uh, as we go along. So I'm seeing things like um, some studying via YouTube, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, there we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and close it. Uh, in the end, 68% new to me. Um, so that's great. We always love it when folks, you know, say it's new to me, you know, it's why we do our webinars to kind of help you uh, better understand what's going on. So there we go. So I'm going to hide the poll and uh, allow you to get on with it, Helen. Cool. I mean, that's interesting stuff. And as you said, this is exactly why we do this sort of webinar to help educate the community out there. Of course, the DevOps Institute uh, SRE Foundation course came out i think january this year craig can confirm that perhaps later uh so it's a relatively new uh discipline but let's go back to the slides and explore that a little bit more are you able to put the slides back up donna Well, right. that is the that is the challenge with being based in Florida and being Floridian is sometimes we have power storms. Anna might have lost power. So, um, Helen, just keep Helen, on and off. Oh, be, good. Excuse me, Lisa. Helen, you should be seeing the slides. I can see the poll still at the moment. I don't know whether I can see the poll as well. <laughs> the poll is still on the screen. I can start talking to my slide uh, whilst you bring it up. So why don't okay, I do ahead. that? So what you're going to see in a moment is you're going to see a table uh, which talks about the origins and comparisons between DevOps and SRE. So 
We didn't ask you yet, but I suspect that many of you are familiar already with DevOps. You may know about the story about where DevOps came from and that it started as uh, a movement from DevOps Days in Ghent in Belgium, uh, that event DevOps Days back in uh, 2009. And we think of SRE as being quite a lot newer. And that's because it kind of is, because it originated with the book that Google published in 2016. But interestingly, Google started practicing uh, SRE or Site Reliability Engineering way before that back in 2003. So you could argue that actually Site Reliability Engineering uh, predates DevOps in that respect. Um, and I like to be a little bit controversial and I kind of think that uh, DevOps started as a conversation around agile system administration and site reliability engineering started as a need to scale. So Google was seeing that they needed to, to scale up. So they kind of had different originating catalysts, if you like, that, that generated the movements. And slightly controversially, I'd like to say that I think DevOps is dev led um, in that it was a reaction to developers starting to embrace agile principles and the realization that ops were being left behind. I still hear it today, although it does make me really cringe, but I do hear customers saying things like, well, DevOps is all about dev really, isn't it? And it's kind of like, which part of the word didn't you hear up there? But SRE is a bit more ops led in that it's a bit more production oriented, a bit more uh, focused on uh, things like, I've got the key concept there about the wisdom of production. Whereas in, in DevOps, those of us very familiar with DevOps know it's by no means all about automation and there's huge considerations that we make around things like culture and lean um, and things that don't necessarily have tools attached to them and software attached to them. But a big part of what we do do in DevOps is around continuous integration and continuous delivery. Uh, I'm also going to be slightly controversial and put out there that I think often that we think DevOps is more about speed and the acceleration of deployments and the uh, increase in the frequency of deployments and accelerating lead time and optimizing flow. Uh, but of course, really, we are trying to balance throughput and stability. But SRE is really, really about all about stability and obviously reliability. And then the last thought I wanted to put in your mind is that DevOps kind of comes from a place where it originated to almost like a lean startup um, type of thinking in the same way that Agile began uh, with Scrum as a, a methodology for single teams. And we've had to learn how to scale Agile to the enterprise using Agile at scale frameworks like uh, Safe and Less and Dad and Scrum of Scrums and, and various different uh, Agile at scale frameworks that we have. Whereas SRE really was designed specifically for the enterprise. It's It's very, roots were built in knowing that uh, scaling needed to happen. So just put that out there as a bit of where these things have come from and setting the scene. And then I'll pass over, I think, next to Donna. Thank you. And we're all seeing the slides now. So um, I'm going to uh, talk about SRE and IDLE. And one of the things that we always like to emphasize is that, you know, where we are now, <clears throat> we're actually seeing everything that's happened in the last 10, 12 years, Agile, Lean, DevOps, um, and now SRE, we're all seeing these, these uh, approaches kind of converging. I think of it like puzzle pieces, and they're all coming together <clears throat> to really enable us to manage a modern enterprise. So when we talk about SRE and IDLE, and it is SRE and IDLE, there's not an or statement in any of that. So SRE is not going to replace any other framework or approach. Organizations really can and should kind of leverage uh, the best of the practices from all of these different approaches to meet the needs of their organization. So if you look at um, how Google uh, describes the responsibilities of an SRE team, they talk about, I always refer to them as the illities, but they talk about things like availability and performance and uh, capacity planning, um, things like change management and monitoring and emergency response. So if you really look at those activities, you see a lot of idle practices coming into play and recall that in in previous versions of IDLE, we talked about processes. In IDLE 4, we talk about practices. And 
one of the tenets of IDLE is that you adopt and you adapt your practices. You uh, adopt a best practice approach, you uh, adopt a customer-centric uh, approach, and then you adapt those practices to meet the needs of your organization. SRE principles and approaches can be used to adapt IDLE practices so we can take some of the really interesting concepts uh, and approaches that are being introduced with SRE and we can use them to benefit our organization. And this is particularly important in organizations that are looking to achieve higher levels of velocity. And we talk in IDLE 4 High Velocity IT that the notion of velocity speaks to the fact that speed makes a difference for your organization. It provides you a competitive advantage, it enables you to meet your objectives, but speed cannot um, be occur uh, you know, at the risk of reliability. We have to strike a balance, and SRE helps us to do that. So I want to talk about a handful of idle practices and some of the SRE principles and approaches that we can draw from in order to adapt those practices. Most of us are familiar with service level management and the notion of SLAs. And service level management really speaks to that approach that we use to kind of negotiate and put in place and then monitor those service level agreements. SRA brings us a couple of additional terms, service level objectives, which are the targets that we set for our service levels, and then service level indicators, which are what we measure in order to understand, are we achieving those objectives? Now, the reality is that we've always had SLOs and SLIs in our service level agreements, right? We've always had embedded in those agreements um, targets and, and how we're gonna measure the attainment of their targets. Again, we, we bring a little more vocabulary uh, from SRE. And also what F SRE emphasizes is really looking proactively at making sure we're meeting our SLOs so we don't have to then look to the service level agreements to understand what are the consequences if we didn't hit those targets. Change enablement, and I always like to emphasize that in IDLE 4 we see this evolution from change management to change enablement, and that's an important word. This practice should not be the no practice. It should not be a practice that's standing in the way of change. It, it's an enabler. And one of the, and I think one of the most interesting uh, concepts that comes to us from SRE is the notion of an error budget. And simply put, an error budget is the maximum amount of time that a system can fail without there being consequences. And again, our SLAs would speak to um, what those consequences are. And in the case of SRE, an error budget policy typically will help you understand what those consequences are. So typically, your um, error budget is one minus the service level objective. So if you have an SLO of 99%, you have 0.1% of an error budget. And that means that you can have some failures, you can have some errors that are, are being introduced into the organization. And sometimes that's what happens when you're trying to go fast, right? When you're trying to take thoughtful risks in order to be competitive within your organization. So an idea is that you spend up that error budget, that again, you're not trying to create a perfect system, you're not trying to do everything you can to minimize and eliminate all your risks. If you're doing that, you're probably not going fast enough to be competitive in this day and age. But you now have this objective measure in the form of an error budget that lets you speak to, okay, what's the line in the sand? At what point do we have too many errors, right? And the consequences it may be things like we're going to put a freeze on new releases until we can determine what's causing those errors or we can determine what's paying down uh, the debt. Again, how your organization approaches that will vary and will be, will be established in your policies, but it's enabling that kind of collaboration across the organization and that need for mutual respect that, again, we can't sacrifice reliability for speed. Incident management, we've talked about the concept of swarming in idle um, for years now, the whole idea of a major incident um, uh, process, 
speaks to that idea of swarming. So rather than having multiple tiers, tier one, tier two, tier two, tier three, which often takes a long time to navigate your way through, let's collaborate, let's work together, let's ensure that anybody who could potentially contribute to resolving this incident is engaged until they don't need to be engaged anymore. One of the other things that SRE does is draw on concepts from the incident command system. And this is really when you look at first responders. So how do our firefighters respond to incidents? Um, there's typically clearly defined um, processes in place and, and, and it's described as an incident command system. And one of the roles that you very often see emerge and you sometimes hear in the context of SRE is the incident commander role. We might have historically called this the incident owner, right? The individual who is kind of coordinating and communicating about and controlling, particularly these major incidents to make sure everybody knows what's going on. So the focus isn't necessarily on, let's make sure we get a ticket and that we're kind of updating that ticket at all times. We can go back and we can collect that documentation. We need to make sure we're staying focused on um, putting that fire out, so to speak, and um, and then kind of coming together and understanding what happened. And problem management can certainly help with that. SREs are problem solvers. They need to be inherently curious. They're often described as detectives, right? They're constantly trying to figure out how things work, why things are working uh, the way they are. And a very important tenet is the idea that we need to learn from failure. So constantly leveraging techniques like blameless po postmortems where you know, you don't blame yourself, you don't blame others, you seek the truth, you look to figure out what happened and why it happened and then what can we do um, to either improve our response in the future or try to um, minimize the impact in the future. And then certainly continual improvement. And this is very much a cultural aspect of SRE, that constant experimentation, constant learning, and constant improvement. And we see with IDLE, some of y'all have heard me say, if you ever hear walk away from a conversation about IDLE 4 and not understand the importance of continual improvement, I haven't done my job. It's part of the service value system. It's a service value chain activity. It's a practice in and of itself. It's really, really key. So, little bit on IDLE 4 and SRE. And one of the concepts I brought up with era, uh, was error budget. So let's do our second poll and see, are you using error budgets and how are you using them? So we have, we don't uh, use error budgets. We use them to balance risk and innovation. We use them to encourage joint ownership. So joint ownership between you know, dev and ops between the business and IT, right? We have them as that objective measure in terms of, you know, what are the consequences when we're may maybe moving a little too fast. We spend them thoughtfully because remember the idea is to spend them and other chat your answers. So far we're seeing 85% we don't. So it is a new concept. And uh, again, I hope that uh, some of you leave here and go off and you know Google and learn a little bit more about error budgets. We also have a section on it in our uh, SRE Foundation course. So I'm going to give you two more seconds. I'm seeing the responses slow down. So in the end, the responses are 88% we don't. 3% we use them to balance risk and innovation, which is awesome and 9% to encourage joint ownership, which is awesome, right? It's just that good objective way of uh, ensuring collaboration. So I am going to now hand over to Nilardi, and I think I got it right this time. There we go, we can see our screens again. And uh, Nilardi is gonna talk about SRE and security. Hi everyone, this is Niladri. So we are talking about reliability and you cannot have a system which is reliable if it is not secure. So as per Google, security and privacy are closely related concepts. So basically what we are talking about is in designing for reliability and security, we have to consider the different risks 
Security is also about risks. Now, primarily, when we are looking at reliability, these risks are non-malicious in nature, like there is a bad software patch or there is a physical device failure. So nobody is trying to harm anyone, but it is just happening. But if you look at the security risks, it is somebody specifically trying to bring harm to the organization. So security risk comes from the adversaries who are actively trying to exploit the system's vulnerabilities. As a site reliability engineer, the responsibility is there to make sure that we take care of those system vulnerabilities. And as you know, that site reliability engineers are the ones who is bridging the gap between the ops and dev. We have seen that dev DevOps was looking more on the cutting across the silos, across the enterprise and bringing everybody together. But the actual dev and ops bridge, bridging is done by SREs. So we have to look at and think through in terms of how this security can be brought in. In doing so, the reliability and security trade-off will need to have more redundancy. That means it will have cost. It may require more things to be done than just taking care of any one side. Now, reliability and security both are concerned about three things. One is confidentiality. Just imagine that you are a pilot and the co-pilot, they are talking among themselves, but somehow that mic in the cockpit has got stuck. So everybody in the tower and every, everywhere else, people are able to hear what they are talking about. That's a breach of confidentiality. So we not only need to look at the software, but also the hardware part of it. Second is integrity. The data integrity has to be there. And that is also something which needs to be looked at from every aspect. A simple memory problem can have a data integrity breach. Third, the availability. We all know that a lot of attacks that happens today is because of denial of service. That means it the system starts doing so much of work that it fills up the RAM, the computing power or whatever it is, and thus it becomes, it crashes and it becomes vulnerable and people can get into it. So we have to understand whether it is really something which is due to a malicious attack for a denial of service, or is it actually a spike because of a lot of information. Say, for example, in a Google kind of a scenario, if you look at uh, the pandemic started, everybody was searching for COVID-19 and everything. So just imagine the amount of searches that increased on one specific topic. So we need to be able to segregate the two and take the necessary action. There are also certain commonalities between reliability and security. That is in terms of, no, we'll, we'll keep it to the previous one itself. Commonalities are both are invisible. So visibility of reliability and security during good times is seen as cost. That's why people don't want to spend on it. Assessments have budgets to assess during good times too. Otherwise, we will get attacked. And there are very many new cases where things have been a problem. Like a system integrator in India, they have got ransomware and now they are struggling with it. So many customers have gone out of it. Third, simplicity. We have to design the systems and the architecture of the infrastructure in such a manner that it is simple. So that's where we are talking about reliability and security trade-off like you need to make sure that you put enough redundancy at the same time you also have the design very simple we will come to the next slide for simplicity but one more point here is like i've given an example of incident management small special small teams with skills to handle security related incidents should be there 
So that training, that skill set to be available has to be there. Security and reliability is also about evolution. It is not going to be great 100% at the beginning. There's nothing called 100% even in security. So we have to keep evolving. Things will change. Today, we have understanding of whatever the current malwares are. But what happens when a new something new comes in? And lastly, resilience. While independent component resilience is possible, we need extra effort to bring the overall resilience in the integrated system. And that also again will need redundancy. So let's go to the next slide. So as per Google's new book, which is building secure and reliable systems, they are putting a lot of effort on the design. So security and reliability consideration should be kept in mind even while translating a great design to a fully deployed production. Investigation of systems and logging is important throughout the life cycle. Crisis response consideration should also be there in the plan. Now, if we have to make it reliable, we have to make the system in such a manner that it is simple enough. When there is an attack, we should be able to overwrite that attack and bring back the business to normal at the minimum time possible. So a uh, security related incident should be handled also as a normal way so that it can be brought up as a way. But the system design has to be such, not only from the software point of view, but also from the point of view of the hardware. So we need design of security and reliability. To do that, we need to, like we need to understand the who are our customers, how they are using the system. Similarly, we have to understand who are our adversaries. And what is the objective of the adversary? Is it for fun? Is it for their fame? Is it for activism? Is it for financial gain or coercion? Is it for manipulation or espionage or destruction? We need to understand that. Then we will be able to do our threat modeling properly to understand what all different threats can come. We need to do design for redundancy. We need to design in such a manner that there is least privilege for everyone. We need to design for understandability. If some attack happens, we need to be able to understand properly. How, how soon can we understand where the problem is, what has happened? It has been seen that from the time a new attack happens, it takes nearly eight months. It is as per Gartner, eight months for even to identify where the problem is. Then we need to have design for changing landscape. Everything will not be the same. Things will keep changing. So we have to also keep changing how we are tackling these problems. We have to bring in the des design for resilience. And finally, we also have to have design for recovery. And the last one is we have to mitigate the denial of service attacks. So our system should be such that we are able to take care of it. And nowadays in the cloud scenario, you have auto scaling and all. But the point is, this is good in one manner that if the usage is increasing, it automatically scales up. But the challenge is it also is difficult to find out or it will take a huge amount of time because by auto scaling, things are getting increased. So we actually don't find out where whether that malware is doing that or not. So we have to constantly keep checking on the logs and see what is happening, what is that thing. And that is where the observability comes into play. That the system in, internally should throw those symptoms to say, hey, this is not a normal peak, but this is created by something else. So like that, we have to design there is a huge, huge amount of focus on the design part of it. I think in five minutes, this is what I can talk about at this point of time. You'll be able to hear more when you are getting into the SRE Foundation course. I hand over back to John. 
Actually, we're going to hand over to Craig. Craig, bring us home. Anna, Niladri, uh, fellow panelists, thanks for having me uh, on the uh, show today. Um, thank you, everybody else, for, for listening into this. Um, before I get into the subject of what I want to talk about, I just wanted to cover a bit of uh, history as to how I got into DevOps and SRE. So I'm a DevOps ambassador with the DevOps Institute, but I got into DevOps quite by accident. Um, I was working for a software company who was very big on uh, package software, putting CDs and DVDs in the post and sending that out to, to consumers. And that wasn't a long-term strategy. The business realized that. They wanted to move to much more of an online capability. Now, I had two different buildings, one that had a research and development team and one that had an IT team. And I was tasked with trying to break down not only the physical barriers, but a lot of the technical, cultural, and you know the, the wall of confusion that existed between those two parties. Now, this was around about the time that the term DevOps was actually coined. So I realized you know, quite by accident that there was an official name for what I was trying to do, and it was DevOps. So fast forward about 10 years, um, I've been working with uh, some organizations, uh, government and private organizations who have been using Agile, have been using DevOps to build large scale services that are uh, satisfying the, the user needs of you know, potentially millions of, of users. Now they themselves then start seeing some challenges around availability, around incident management, around burnout of staff and staff morale and retention issues. And lo and behold, there was a name for that. You know, SRE was a way of trying to address some of those concerns. So that's how I got into to SRE and it really did provide a broader spectrum of options to, to deal with challenges that org organizations are facing. Um, uh, I curated the DevOps uh, Foundation course for SRE, which, is, which was launched earlier this year. Um, and what I'm always doing when I'm talking with, with new, new customers, new clients who are interested in, in SRE and, and DevOps for that matter is, you know, what does it mean for them? What is the value? What are the benefits that they're going to get out of embracing things like SRE? You know, when I talk to the execs of companies, you know, they don't care what these newfangled things are called. They're just interested in what it means for the bottom line. So I'd like to share with you some of the benefits that you will uh, hope to get from adoption of some of the SRE practices, both at the organizational level, but also at the individual level. So for the organization itself, it goes without saying that we want to move towards enhanced ability and reliability of services. It's baked into the name SRE. It is all about reliability and this chapter and verse on, on how we do that. Um, one of the, the hidden benefits we get through SRE is this concept of the wisdom of production. There's no better place to learn about how services run, operate, why they fail, the kind of data and metrics they're giving, you know, the best way to get that experience is by actually being close to the production environment, understanding that living and breathing environment to the point where you start to build quite a lot of, of wisdom of production. And what you can then do is use that information to help out with the development of the services that are, that are being deployed. Um, the other thing you get with uh, SRE is, the, the, is you're getting the business voice uh, represented in some technical discussions. Uh, previously, we would have things like non-functional requirements, which were an afterthought to service delivery. Actually, what we're seeing now with SRE is that the business are placing their expectations front and center in terms of how they want to support an online customer experience. These are enshrined in things like SLOs and the error budgets that we, we touched on previously. The key thing there is that they should be set by the business. These are business um, objectives. They, they are promises that a business is making to their, their customers. These aren't technical things, they are very much business things. Okay, as I alluded to earlier, this concept of taking the wisdom of production and shifting it left into the development teams is a, is a very strong one. I saw so many teams using Agile and using DevOps to create lots and lots of new fantastic value adding services and getting them live to the point where the production environment was starting to creak, was becoming a bit overwhelmed. Now through SRE, we have an equal voice at the table. When we're talking about new features, new services, not only is it about functionality, it's also about reliability, stability, starting to design for, for the operational impact of what you're building. And that ultimately gives you more, more reliable services. There's also a lot to do with the individual. So typically what you see through embracing SRE is improvements in staff morale and retention. 
So I'll consider those on the next slide. So as an individual here, what we're saying is with SRE, we're going to give you a bit more time. We're going to ring fence some time so you can not only deal with your sort of day-to-day -day workload, but actually look to try and reduce the amount of toil, the non-value adding work that you are continually doing. And actually what we're saying as well is we want to use your expertise to see where we can introduce improvements to the platform, to the products and services, and to the team. Okay. We also want to make the on-call experiences much, much less stressful. What we want to do is try and avoid burnout by automating as much as we can that incident response, try and move to some automated response management, actually starting to move to automated fixes that have been triggered through practices like chaos engineering. That concept of chaos engineering where you introduce failure to your production environments is a very, very good learning tool. It makes you uh, aware of the, the weaknesses in your services and can allow you to create some automated uh, responses to those failures. And we've touched a bit on blameless postmortems as well. You know, with the best chaos engineering in the world, there will still be outages and incidents and they just need to be um, managed uh, accordingly. OK, as part of being an SRE, we're obviously moving towards the broader toolbox of things. A lot of people love the tech that is available in this space containers and Kubernetes being some of the buzzwords that SREs are, are working with. So if you do want to be using some of those sort of tools, then SRE is for you. Um, what we're also building with this is a, a sort of step towards the improvement in workplace culture. We've talked about the Westrum model a lot in, in sort of DevOps circles, trying to change the organization's attitude to things like failure, to messaging, and to, to sort of people crossing the, the organizational divides just to provide a, a better experience. Um, it also helps with individuals and their ability to shift left to help development teams better understand the production environment. Getting that wisdom of productions into teams is, is key. So by doing all of this, we should see some improvements in morale and, and better staff retention, which ultimately benefits the, the organization. So there's the kind of benefits you should start to see by starting to embrace some of these SRE practices. Okay, with that, I'll hand back to the panel. So we have our last poll question talking about toil and what percentage of time you're spending on toil. And so far, we're seeing, for a moment in time, it was like 50% too much and 50% hardly any. So that's interesting. Um, so we'll give it a few more seconds. We've got about 50% have voted. So we're seeing 67% too much, 16% hardly any. So congrats to you all. And 28% uh, too scared to find out, which is, uh, which is understandable. You know, sometimes what we don't know won't hurt me. So there's our our final tally uh, for our uh, last poll. So uh, we're now going to turn back to Helen to uh, kind of facilitate the the next parts of our session. Yeah, we're going to kick off the panel discussion. We are running a little bit over. I don't think there's any surprise about that because we're all so passionate about this topic. Um, I love that Craig can actually remember kind of discovering some of these words. I think I can kind of remember when I first heard DevOps, I was working in deployment automation at the time, but I really can't remember when the SRE kind of snuck up on me. I wonder, Donna, can you remember when you first heard the term SRE? I actually can't. And I, I, I think it was 24, 2015, something like that. But it was very early days. In fact, we had just um, launched the DevOps Foundation class. And I was teaching a DevOps Foundation class at a DevOps event. And one of the people attending that class was from Home Depot. And he brought up the idea of SRE. And he's the one that first introduced me to the concept of error budgets. And I'm always fascinated when I realize that something's been around for a long time and I'm just now hearing about it. But I think that's the nature of the game, right? You don't know what you don't know until you find out you didn't know it. Um, and I was very excited too to learn that, 
you know, I see ESRI having a very similar trajectory that, that DevOps did, that it started out kind of with the Googles and the Facebooks, you know, those, you know, large scale uh, organizations, and it's now finding its way into the enterprise and, and especially in the last couple of years, really gaining momentum in the enterprise. Yeah, and that beautifully flows us into our next question, which I'm going to put to Niladri. Niladri, where are you seeing site reliability engineering being used today? So, uh, thanks, uh, Helen. Uh, SRE, currently, there is a lot of confusion, is what I see. But typically, as expected, a lot of this is coming from the operations side. So a lot of organizations are moving their operations people to do more than what they are doing currently and get into the SRE front. And one of the challenges that I also see them facing is we were, that they were used to doing things which is more maintaining of the, of the infrastructure and network and all, but suddenly they are being told that they also have to code. So that brings in a bit of a, a challenge for them. But uh, if we look at the original starting in uh, Google, there was two sets of uh, people that get got into uh, SRE. One is the system administrators and the other, which is called the SA team, and the other is the SRE SE which is the software engineers. So it was two different teams which came together as part of the SRE. So I think there, there is a need for both sides to come together, not just predominantly from the operation side. And you're touching on one of the pre-questions that we were sent by the audience when they registered actually in the library there as well, which um, I'm going to ask Craig to answer, but um, we had a question from Mike. As organizations transition to DevOps, which traditional IT roles and careers have you seen move into the SRE role? This is an interesting one because what I see is some parallels with what happened in the DevOps space. I saw many organizations wanting to jump on, on onto DevOps and created DevOps teams, DevOps center of excellence, basically taking some of the best engineers who could automate some tasks and, and sort of creating an, another silo. And I, I sometimes see this in SRE, that SREs are, are rebadged operational people. So some of the bright lights for ops are being rebadged as, as SREs. And that's a bit of an anti-pattern really. What we want to do is look across that spectrum of delivery and make sure we've got each aspect covered. You know, for me, this is all about the value stream. We want to get the greatest ideas into the hands of our users quicker, but in a stable and reliable way. You know, if you're involved in the sort of end aspect of that in terms of deployment, keeping services running, monitoring, anything to do with reliability and availability, then, then SRE is for you. What we want is engineers. You know, it's, it's very much an engineering principle. The, the E is, you know, is engineering. So it's a lot about taking common engineering practices and having them across the whole value stream. So some value stream thinking there as well. So interestingly, and I've kind of merged us into the Q and A session, Donna. I hope you don't mind. But this is why we're kind of starting to think about value stream thinking. It's um, value stream. Uh, thinking and value stream mapping are, as many of the audience I know, um, I'm sorry, I'm sure already know or are aware, are concepts that come out of the Lean Toolkit. One of the other questions that we had uh, pre-registration was um, around whether we see any of the existing frameworks like ITIL or DevOps or Lean or Agile um, being replaced um, by SRE. Um, Donna, since you picked up uh, the section on SRE and ITIL, why don't you start with your thoughts about whether SRE is a replacement framework? So I wouldn't use the term replacement and, and, I, and I really wouldn't use that term in the context of any of those combinations. So DevOps doesn't replace IDLE, you know, IDLE doesn't replace something else. I think they all have a kind of scope um, and a focus and they all work together. Again, I always draw the analogy of puzzle pieces, that they all work together um, 
and 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 in the context of that value stream, they really span the entire end-to-end -end value stream. If you look at um, these different approaches, um, very often they're they're that they're, they focus on one particular part of the value stream, but not necessarily the entire end-to-end -end value stream. Um, so they work together. One's not replacing the other. You can leverage, and, and I think, you know, in the spirit of lifelong learning, you know, leverage any and all, you know, approaches and principles and techniques that you can gain from, from these various frameworks as needed to meet the needs of your organization. Yeah, I totally agree. And Craig and I, I'm, I'm sure, have had this conversation on other panels. And actually, I think Niladri and I had this conversation recently on a, another SRE panel that he set up. And I think part of this is, you know, we live in a really complex world and there's a lot of history and a lot of thought systems have been developed over time. And we all kind of walk into these systems from a different place and discover others. So your background is very much kind of ITIL, isn't it, Donna? Whereas mine, I guess, was more from the agile development area. I think Ladris was ITIL. So we all kind of come into it. So when I think about these systems, I tend to think of them from the DevOps angle. So I have this thing called the DevOps super pattern, I call it. And for me, ITSM and Agile and Lean all sit around my DevOps super pattern, along with now SRE, but other things like the theory of constraints and holacracy and sociocracy um, and safety cultures and learning organizations. All those, to me, are kind of contributions to um, the, what I drive as a, D a DevOps way of working. Niladri, do you mm -hmm. have anything? add to that in terms of what systems of thoughts you see playing in the space and how they complement each other or how they might replace one another? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, whatever two people have said, I can add that each one of the framework that we are talking about is trying to improve in its own way. And if we look at DevOps and SRE, First of all, they complement each other. They are not replacing or trying to prescribe a different way of doing things as a new framework. It is building on the strengths of whatever is already there. So if you look at Agile, Agile is about faster delivery. So that's the area. If you look at DevOps, if you look at SI, we are trying to deliver faster. So that faster delivery is talking about we are using the agile in. If we look at service management, the service management all are release and deployment, configuration management, knowledge management, incident management, problem management. All of these are already defined in idea. We are taking that strength and using it in DevOps and SRB. Similarly, we are looking at the complete flow from left to right, and that's where we are using the lean. So those are different factors, which are different frameworks, which we are bringing together to deliver a much faster, safer, stabler, and so, as somebody said, happier product so, and services. So people are happy, everything is being done in a flow, bringing everything together. Helen, if I can add to that, yeah. if I may. Um, people think sometimes that there's too many frameworks and things out there, uh, but if the lockdown, you know, due to COVID is anything uh, to go by, you know, more and more of us will be using online digital services. And what that means is more and more organizations are starting to spin up services that need to scale, be reliable for many, many thousands, if not millions of users and transactions. So this is a, a sort of a real sort of uh, and developing uh, issue. Um, I'm, I've been working with a, with a traditional sort of banking organization. And, and, and if I had gone in there on day one and said, you need some Agile, you need some DevOps, you need some SRE, you know, you, you need some ITIL in there, they would have said, no, 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 that's just all buzzwords. But actually what's happened in the space of about 12 months is they are embracing all of those approaches, not in their entirety. You know, I view it as, you know, what is the right tool to solve a particular uh, problem? Each of these different areas, different frameworks is useful in solving a particular problem. And that organization now is running massive online services, you know, at scale for, for many, many thousands of users, something they didn't think they would be looking at about 12 months ago. So there's definitely scope for all of these to be complementary to one another. 
So as we've just kind of established during the polls, um, this is kind of emerging, but you've just been talking about enterprise um, adoption. So let's have a think then about, I know Craig, you and I've got a long history of assessing capabilities in uh, organisations around DevOps, but how do we go around or go about measuring site reliability engineering capability, capability in a team or an organisation? I'm going to put that to Craig first since he brought up the topic of enterprise adoption. It's always difficult to measure. I've seen very, you know, I've seen a, quite a few different maturity sort of matrices models for things, but a lot of this is is subjective. For, for me, I always sort of look at the results. You know, what is the results that come that come out the end? You know, if you are dealing with outages, how quickly do you deal with those? Is there a trend that outages are reducing? You know, are you moving towards more frequent deployments and burning your error budget accordingly? Uh, you know, I, I tend to look at those as the evidence. Of whether things are working or not. If, if I don't see any evidence in those areas, then I know some things like SRE, you know, some of the SRE practices can be introduced to, to help. So I tend to steer away a bit from the subjective uh, measures and look more at the, the data and the, the evidence. What about Niladri? How would you do it? And how do you measure how well something is being adopted across an organization in this context? Uh. First of all, I would like to understand why we are doing it. Because different organizations may have different reasons for doing it. So for example, if an organization is spending a lot of time on toil or effort on toil, and if that is the objective that we want to reduce the toil, then definitely I would look at a situation like how much of automation has been done. How much automation is giving benefit to reduction of toil. Whereas if the objective is to make systems more stable, then I will look at things like NTTR. I would look, like to look at things like uh, the stability, that is what if, whether the availability is increasing, those kind of factors, which is related to lesser outage and more normal business being happening. So it all depends on what the objective that organization has with what they started to do the implementation of SR. I love the fact that we can have this conversation about toil now as well. It's um, when I was working in deployment automation years ago, kind of pre the Google book, we used to talk about manual kind of onerous erroneous kind of really kind of boring tasks and we kind of talked about making people happier in this industry and i think that's a big part of what drives me to promote and help people practice these ways of working is actually trying to bring more joy to work and i think generally our industry is full of extremely talented people that don't want to be toiling away kind of that word to me, it brings up visions of kind of Disney fairy tales down the mine, kind of like at the coal face, toiling away. But let's let's think about what that that actually looks like in our industry. So, Donna, what kind of types of toil do you come across um, when you're speaking to customers and organisations about the work they're doing? What does toil actually look like? So, we can always put the word manual in front of anything when it comes to, to toil. So anything, if you are manually cutting and pasting some command, um, you know, that you need to issue, if you are manually uh, applying a change, um, manually pushing uh, a, a new release into your production environment. So anything where there's that manual activity, manually, stopping and looking at an alert and trying to figure out and analyze and understand what's happening with that alert. Um, and the idea is that these are things where um, you're doing them, you're doing them repetitively and there's, you know, uh, an opportunity there and, 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 and hopefully at a reasonable cost to automate it. And that way you then free your time up, right, to, to, to go and work on other improvement initiatives. And I just want to add, Rose actually kind of commented in that I like that we now have a name for something that we 
all experienced in the form of toil and that SRE gives us some techniques we can use to address it holistically and I agree with that and I think it's this I hope that this this concept doesn't stick with SRE that we carry it over into idle and into DevOps and into you know all, you know all of our day-to-day -day activities I totally agree and that's what I kind of said about I love the fact that we can talk about this we can talk about this the fact that there's work that we don't that we don't want to do so let's look at that work that we don't want to do that doesn't get, bring us joy and work out how to to get rid of it and, and give it to to a computer to do instead so we only have a handful of minutes left so i'm going to go to our final panel question uh, which is what's next for sre so craig do you want to pick that up first what is next generation sre sre 2.0 going to look like in your opinion so for me, I think as the business takes more ownership of uh, some setting things like uh, SLOs in our budgets, uh, I think we'll move away from a one-size-fits-all kind of mentality. Um, that's mainly focused on technical measures like availability and reliability and that, that kind of thing towards things that are more business process centric. So um, having different SLOs, you know, if you're an online accounting system provider, for example, you may have a different SLO and error budget for uh, transactions that are much more important than others. So if you want to pay your, pay your staff salaries, if you want to receive income, then you would probably have an SLO for those business processes that is higher than maybe some less important financial processes like fixed assets or, you know, raising a purchase order. So I think we will see much more crystallization of SLOs and error budgets along business process lines. What about you, Donna? What do you think? Are you in agreement with Craig that's going to be about merging with the, the business value stream or is there something different that you think is coming next? I agree with him 100% and I'm going to state it in a slightly different way. I am excited to see IT professionals understanding that it's about the business. Um, SREs really do need to understand what's important to the business and making sure, you know, that whole balance between innovation and reliability is at the end of the day a business decision and SREs need to understand that and they need to participate in those conversations. So while it's very often viewed as a very technical role and it's all about the IT, at the end of the day, this is evolving IT professionals to much more of a business focused perspective. So I agree, you know, Craig looked at it kind of from the organizational standpoint and I and, and I like looking at it from the individual uh, perspective. I think it applies equally in both cases. Cool, I'm gonna let Niladri have the last word, but I'm just gonna put my two cents in first. I tell you- have. We actually have two questions that are very similar. So once 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 you all weigh in, um, I'll I'm gonna I'm gonna put out two more questions for everybody who's uh, attending. Uh, we're we've got a couple more minutes. If you need to leave at 12 o'clock, um, thank you so much for attending. Uh, if you want to stick around, we've got a couple more questions that we'll go ahead and answer related to the service desk. Um, and um, but for now, back to you, Helen. I'm going to let you run with it because I do have to drop off in two minutes. So you go ahead okay. with your questions. Well, well Donna, it's Lisa. I'm I sorry. I'm ju I just wanted to jump in to say that as a thank you gift for everyone who attended today, we're putting into chat right now a, um, a gift code for 15% off registration for SRE Foundation in September. So back to you. Sorry. So I think. Um, the larger you were going to weigh in, Helen was asking you to weigh in on where you see SRE heading, first of all. Yeah, uh, so at this point of time, I think there's a long way to go for a lot of organizations on the SRE front, but uh, I agree with charity measures that observability will be one of the important aspects to look at. People have to look at doing things differently. There's a going to be a lot of change in terms of accepting from the operation side that their way of working has changed and that they have to accept and work more towards it. And third point, which is which I find very important is 
the value of experience. That is something which is going to be more and more predominant. People who are having experience are the ones who is going to lead this forward. That doesn't mean that the juniors will not be there. They will learn from the others and become more experienced. And that will lead to more work-life balance and better quality of delivery. So we will see a much better ENBS for the people. Hello. Excellent. Thank you.